Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Doug Jorgensen, the VP of Engineering at Marky Microwave. And today I'm going to be talking about uh, a subject that is near and dear to my heart, and that is IQ, Image Reject, and Single Sideband Mixers. Um, so first, a couple of uh, housekeeping things. Um, the uh, there's a QA. and a there's a, a Q&A through the webinar that you can ask questions. I'm not going to be monitoring that during the talk, um, but at the end, I'll stick around and answer any questions that you've got. And right now I'm going to launch a, a little quiz that you can follow along with and about halfway through, we'll um, review the answers to this. And uh, it, hopefully it helps guide you on some of the material that I'm trying to cover. Now, I, I call this um, IQ, IR, and SSB mixers demystified because I find the operation of IQ mixers to be very confusing. Um, just physically, it's a tough thing to wrap my, my head around. And so I spent a lot of time trying to devise different methods to understand what these devices are doing and how they're doing it. And that's what I'm going to spend the first part of my talk on. Um, so the first... Uh, first quarter of the, the talk is going to be on the operation of, of IQ mixers and how they do what they do. The next, uh, the next part is going to be on the um, constituent components uh, and performance metrics for the IQ mixers and how they go together and what kind of um, performance you should look for from each one of those components. And then in the second half of the talk, I'm going to be talking about applications information. And specifically, I'm going to talk about um, some common questions that we get, especially from researchers and other novice users on the tech support line. So first, what is an IQ mixer? So you should know by now that a mixer is a device that uh, takes an, a, a, an LO tone and an input signal and produces uh, a frequency offset version of the input signal at uh, the LO plus the input signal frequency and the LO minus the input signal frequency. And that's what we call double-sided uh, conversion. An IQ mixer uh, is two of these mixers uh, driven in quadrature. And when I say quadrature, I mean that the LO tone is 90 degrees out of phase uh, between the two mixers. Uh, and then the output signal is combined. Uh, and when the, I'll get into the reasons that we drive it in quadrature, but the easiest way to think of it is that 90 degrees is halfway to 180 degrees and 80, 180 degrees means signal cancellation. So there's the two sidebands in, inherit that phase differently. And we'll talk about that in a minute. The reason that I, I love IQ mixers so much is that um, as a company, Marky uh, specializes in these types of split phase splitters where you have a, uh, you take an input signal and then you divide it in two and apply a phase shift to one arm. Uh, sometimes it's an in-phase power divider or a quadrature power divider or a ballon, which is a 180 degree power divider. And those are all the, the interesting ones. And the, you can always use them uh, to cancel out unwanted signals. And it's such an elegant way to do it. And the IQ mixer combines all of these together. So inside the, uh, the mixers, there's balance. Uh, and then there's a an LO quad hybrid and then an RF in phase power combiner. And you need all of these things to be balanced and trying to get that balance across broad bandwidths is the big challenge. Uh, and that's what makes them cool. It's uh, an IQ mixer or a single sideband mixer is actually a, a subset of a broader category. If you keep adding phases, sub phases, you can actually cancel out more and more, you know, various harmonics. Um, but that's not something I'm gonna get into today. So that's what an IQ mixer is. What does it do? Why do we care about it? So let's imagine, let's start with a, a sort of the trivial example of a, a microwave problem or a, an RF problem. You, uh, need, you want to do a wireless data transmission over a noisy transmission channel. And you have some fixed, um, oh, I'm going to start my pointer. Um, you have some fixed bandwidth allotted to you, indicated by these dotted red lines by the, the FCC or, or physical limitations, whatever. So you've got, uh, say it's 20 megahertz of, of data, 20 megahertz of bandwidth. 
So easy, you upconvert with your LO. But as I said, a normal upconversion is double-sided upconversion. You get the upper sideband and then you get a spectrally uh, inverted lower sideband. Now you can't transmit that because you don't have the bandwidth, so you have to eliminate it. Uh, and so you need a, a bandpass filter, an image bandpass filter to eliminate the unwanted sideband. This is problematic because now you're at, uh, filtering out the IF is relatively easy. The percent bandwidths are, are not that challenging, but at the RF, uh, you're already at a high frequency. And if you have a narrow frequency signal at a low IF, then you need a very narrow uh, percent bandwidth filter. And that means that it's gotta be large and expensive, maybe lossy. There's bad trade-offs to be made. But you put it in, then you transmit across your noisy transmission channel. Now, when you down convert this signal on your receive side, this noise over here uh, can be filtered out at the IF. So, so you have an IF filter to get your original signal back and you'll, you'll probably low pass filter it and get rid of all the higher frequency harmonics. But what you cannot get rid of is the noise at uh, the LO minus the IF frequency, which is called the image. Um, so where the, where the lower sideband would be, now there's noise and you down convert that noise into your signal. So you're only down converting one copy of your signal, but you're down converting two copies of your noise. And this gives you a three dB penalty in noise figure. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, upper, upper single sideband versus double sideband uh, noise figure sort of describes this. So what do we do uh, if we want to get rid of that noise? We add another filter. Uh, and this filter has all of the same problems that this other filter did. It's narrow percent bandwidth, so it's big and bulky and, and annoying. How do we get rid of this with a single sideband? it just kind of goes away. So single sideband and image reject mixers are real easy to visualize. A single sideband mixer uh, is a three port device that takes in uh, the same signals as a uh, standard mixer, but it just doesn't make a second sideband. So you don't need this filter. So your problem is, is already solved. Then you transmit it over the noisy transmission channel. An image reject mixer is the down converting version of a single sideband mixer. So single sideband mixers are always up converting. Image reject mixers are always down converting. Um, so the image reject mixer rejects the noise in the image sideband and you get back your original signal. So you've eliminated these unwanted signals and you have saved yourself this uh, annoying bandpass filter, high frequency bandpass filter. Now, the operation of the IQ mixer, as I said, is a little bit um, weirder and more esoteric. So if you look at the IQ mixer, um, you have two channels. So it's not a, it's not a three port device anymore. Now it's a four port device. It's got those two, um, those two IFs. And imagine I said that you had a 20 megahertz channel. Now instead of transmitting one 20 megahertz signal, you have two 10 megahertz signals and you have to transmit both sidebands. And I'll explain why in a minute. Um, but you, can't, you, you cannot filter out uh, one, the lower sideband or it, it doesn't work, but you don't have to filter out the lower sideband anymore. Um, so you transmit both sidebands, you receive twice the signal power at the receiver side. Um, and then the receiver IQ mixer decodes the transmitted signal back into the original I and Q signals. Um, so you can see that you've again, saved yourself from these filters. Um, but you've done it in this now mysterious way where you're transmitting two sidebands instead of this, the normal one. So why do you do this? Uh, this is hopefully not, not an overly confusing slide. If you transmit a single sideband, uh, a, just normal data transmission, you just transmit some data at a high frequency. Um, a single tone, for example, when you down convert it, the LO does not need to be coherent. So here I'm showing that you transmit with a, um, a cosine and you down convert with a sine and you get back sine of your IF. Uh, it could be a cosine, it could be a sine, it could be anywhere in between, it doesn't matter. The phasing between the L and the R doesn't matter for a single sideband down conversion. However, if you have a double-sided down conversion, uh, over here I'm showing two different um, 
two different cases of double-sided down conversion. So you transmit both sidebands and uh, you inject them into the RF. And in one case, you down convert with a cosine. And in one case, you down convert with a sine. When you down convert with the, the coherent LO, the two sidebands recombine constructively and add together. You, you end up with twice the uh, sideband power minus the conversion loss at your IF. When you down convert with a quadrature uh, LO, the two sidebands inherit that, that quadrature different um, and the baseband ends up canceling out. So if you take a double-sided transmission and you can try this experimentally, this is how I discovered it. Um, if you down convert with a cosine, you get twice the signal transmission. If you down convert with a sine, you get uh, no, none of the signal transmission. So this uh, structure obviously motivates the IQ mixer, right? We've got two mixers driven in quadrature uh, and the RF is driven by the same signal and you get two different outputs at the IF. So that's basically an IQ mixer. Um, now to, to further illustrate this, uh, I'm going to try to try to go through a quick graphical demonstration. Um, imagine that you're transmitting this two sets of data, one represented by this L block, one represented by this lightning bolt. This is a phasor diagram of where each of the signals is at. So initially they're both coherent. They're both, they, they have no meaningful phase. They're just whatever the phase they come in at. Now you upconvert one coherently. Now your LO becomes your phase reference. So you upconvert one uh, with the cosine and one sideband is spectrally inverted, but, but they both have the same phase. You convert one with a uh, sine wave. So now they are, the upper uh, sideband is rotated by minus 90 degrees. The, upper, the lower sideband is rotated by um, plus 90 degrees. So what's interesting is now this, the two sidebands are out of phase with each other. And then you uh, combine those together to transmit it over your whatever channel. When you get to the receive side, you break them back out and uh, both mixers get both copies of both signals. But the uh, one that is down converted with a coherent LO, uh, you see the, uh, the two in phase signals add together constructively. Uh, and then the two quadrature signals are just combined without an additional phase shift. And since I said they're out of phase with each other, with each other that means they cancel. On the um, quadrature side, the sine wave side, the two signals that were in phase both receive a, another phase shift and then combine together and cancel. Whereas the, uh, the two signals that were out of phase with, with each other both receive another phase shift uh, and they add together constructively. So the reason all of this works is that the phase, uh, because it's LO plus IF and LO minus FIF, uh, the phases add on the upper side and subtract on the lower side. So this is just one, so I've gone through kind of, I've hand waved my way through two different ways of thinking about this. Uh, one is the sine wave, you know, sine cosine derivation. Um, just as a side note, that doesn't generally work for commutating mixers uh, in terms of amplitude. But if you're trying to keep track of the phase and the frequency, then you can use uh, cosine derivations. Um, I've tried to show it graphically here. If you um, go to the, the mixer primer, the IQ mixer primer, you can also see uh, where I did a derivation using complex exponentials. And the math is very fast using complex, complex exponentials, but I don't think that it uh, gives you as much physical intuition. So that's the operation of the IQ mixer. I'm not gonna go through the same uh, steps for the image reject and single sideband mixer. I'm just going to explain the structure of it. Now you take the same structure as the IQ mixer here, and instead of putting in two different signals, you put in two copies of the same signal that are offset from each other by 90 degrees. So now you have uh, one copy that comes in at zero degrees, one copy that comes in at 90 degrees, and then depending on whether it's the upper or lower sideband, that 90 degrees becomes 
180 degrees if it adds 90 degrees or it becomes zero degrees if it subtracts. So the two sidebands get that, that 90 degrees differently again. And when you recombine them uh, at the RF signal, you have one in-phase sideband and one out-of-phase sideband. And uh, so the result is, as, as you see below, you get suppression of one sideband. Um, single sideband, as I, as I mentioned, a single, single sideband always refers to upconversion, where you're suppressing one sideband. Uh, if you're talking about an image reject mixer, it's the exact same structure, um, but in, in this case, you are down converting. Um, and you, the math and the physics basically works out the same. Now, Marky Microwave, as a company, we don't make many uh, single sideband and image reject mixers. I think we still have a, one or two legacy versions, but we don't make new ones. And why don't we make new ones? Well, the reason is that uh, all of this stuff up here, these the power divider, the quad hybrid, the mixers, they're broadband, high frequency, hard to make, hard to planarize, uh, interesting to do. They're all the kind of stuff that we like to work on. But this IF hybrid is pretty easy to do. Lots of people make them and they're always application specific. So if you're at a 100 megahertz IF, then you need a different uh, IF hybrid than if you're at a 250 megahertz IF, typically. Um, so you can't, it, it's hard to make a, a, a DC to six gigahertz uh, IF hybrid. It's impossible to do. But there are many vendors that make these things. And the reason is that at RF frequencies, you can use these quad hybrids for making balanced amplifiers. People do that in volume. So there's lots of people making lots of these. We have a, it's a very common question, where, how do I make an IIR mixer out of your IQ mixers? And we have a table of IF hybrids on our website. It had, um, when I compiled it, I think three or five years ago, it had 650 entries on it. So that's one way that you can do it. The other more common way that people drive IQ mixers, especially in a system, they just do it digitally. Don't bother with, um, with, uh, trying to to match, you know, your your IF frequency, you can do a DC to whatever gigahertz um, digital uh, quad hybrid in your analog to digital or digital to analog converter, and that also gives you other advantages, like you, you're you're able to calibrate, as I'll show later. Um, so, if you can afford this the overhead in in figuring out how to program it, um, you're better off using a two channel A to D converter. Uh, and then digitally post-processing your I and Q into um, a single sideband. And then you don't have to, I, I, I'm not an expert on this, but I believe you don't have to have a coherent LO. I think you can take the incoherent uh, data and add an arbitrary phase shift to it and, and reconstruct it uh, within your, your digital processor. So as I'm showing here, uh, so like I said, you you, you get a suppressed sideband, you don't get an, the elimination of a sideband, but you also have other problems when you're doing a single sideband up conversion. And these are all related to the physical limitations of the IQ mixer. So now I'm gonna talk about that for a little while. Uh, when you do a single sideband up conversion, you get the upconverted sideband, you suppress the other sideband, but as a rule, the LO feed through is always closer to the upconverted sideband than the suppressed sideband. And the 2i by 1l spur is also mathematically closer to the upconverted sideband than the suppressed sideband is. So if you, unless you have a mixer that has good suppression of these terms, um, you are not going to get much benefit from the suppressed sideband. Now what determines that? The L to R isolation is 100% determined by the mixer core that you use. So the mixer core is the, the steak in the, the dinner of the IQ mixer. Uh, a good, if you don't have a good mixer core, then you are not gonna have a good IQ mixer. Uh, the balance of the internal mixer construction determines the L to R isolation. It determines the L to I isolation, which is important for image reject mixing because if you have noise feed through, uh, then it doesn't matter if you suppress the image noise. The linearity is determined essentially by the, the diode height of these uh, 
the, the barrier height of the diodes inside, which is why Marky offers uh, L diode, H diode, and S diode IQ mixers. And the two mixers have to be matched very well to each other. Uh, as I'll show towards the end, any imbalance in the mixer cores or any of the other components leads to a degradation in the sideband suppression, which is the marquee spec for a, an IQ mixer. The next component uh, in terms of the sort of the least important component in the IQ mixer is the power splitter combiner. Um, it's, it's the easiest one because in phase is always easier than out of phase. It can't, you can use a reactive um, T and you can use a resistive combi power combiner, but those aren't as good. Wilkinson is the best. A resistive power divider uh, gives you a 6 dB loss, so there's no point in taking a, a 6 dB loss off the top. Uh, and a reactive power divider is just a Wilkinson without the isolation resistor. And because you've got so many different um, signals bouncing around in the IQ mixer, and because you're trying to get a cancellation of the two sidebands by combination, you really want that, that, count, that combination happens in the uh, isolation resistor. So if you don't have an isolation resistor, it just reflect back into your mixers and you know, cause degradation. The most critical um, performance spec for this device though is not the phase, it's not the isolation, it's the phase and the amp balance. Any degradation in phase and especially amplitude balance um, shows up as a degradation in sideband suppression. And the last uh, component that I'm going to talk about is the quad splitter. It's also the most interesting and important component that really drives the IQ mixer. If you can make a perfect quad splitter, there are so many different amazing circuits that you can make in microwave, um, but you can't. And so the, you, you can't, you can make some of these, but not a lot of them. For an, uh, an IQ mixer in, in particular, the quad splitter only has to operate on a single tone and it only has to split. You don't have to have a, a power combination, uh, so you don't have to have isolation. You don't have to have broad bandwidth. Uh, and even further, the phase balance is very important, but the amplitude balance is not important to some extent. You need some amplitude balance, but you can get away with a pretty big deviation in amplitude balance. And the reason is that the LO only serves in a commutating mixer to turn the switches on and off uh, on the diodes. So most mixers will operate pretty well within a 5 dB band of um, LO drives. And so if you have a, an amp balance problem or an insertion loss problem in your quad splitter, you can always just bump up the LO and overdrive it, and that will solve a lot of your problems, except in some applications. So with all those caveats about the quad splitter, I'm going to talk now about different cool methods that you can use to make these quad splitters. The first and trivial example is a power divider with a time delay. This has the advantage that it's easy to implement and you can tune the time delay if you have a tunable, you know, time shifter, a trombone maybe, but it's not a phase shift. Uh, if you, you have to have like basically a fixed LO, and every time you change the LO, you have to change your time shift. But if you're doing a lab experiment and you really want to tune in the, um, the, the phase very precisely, you, this might be an interesting way for you to do it. Um, you could you know, sit on the bench and look at your suppression and tune it down to, until you get really small numbers. It, the amp balance won't be good because these are unmatched in terms of amplitude, but it, like I said, that isn't as important for an IQ mixer. Um, the next method is a branch line coupler. This is sort of a microwaves, you know, very basic microwave circuit. Uh, any undergrad can design it in, uh, in microwave office. And it's easy to implement. The downside is that it's, um, it's only narrow band. It's like 20% bandwidth, something like that. Uh, and it's physically large. But if you're trying to make like a, a, a test structure for a project, it's, it's fine. Uh, and the last one on this slide is the most ubiquitous quad splitter in the world. And that's because it integrates with CMOS. This is the polyphase filter quad splitter. And I'm not, I'm not an expert on these devices um, because I'm not an expert on CMOS. 
Um, but from these the simulations that I've run, uh, it's pretty obvious they're they're cheap, they're small, they go on a CMOS chip. They're not very good as in terms of circuits. They very high loss, especially if you want a broad bandwidth. You have to cascade multiple stages together, and the multiple stages leads to a a, a big increase in the loss. You have to drive them with a differential differential input to start. Um, they have poor isolation. Just electrically, they're not a very good circuit, but uh, they go on CMOS, so who cares? Uh, next is the old microwave stalwart, the Lang coupler. The Lang coupler is a, a real good circuit. It's in every textbook, so you know everybody knows how to design them. Um, they're very useful for balanced amps, and uh, I think we have some IQ mixers that are driven with Lang couplers. The the they're wideband. They uh, can be made essentially planar. All of the downside comes from this this jump over. So if you're trying to to build these in a process that has like a good M2 layer uh, with crossovers, then you're pretty solid. If you have to use air bridges, then you know then air bridges aren't as nice. If you're trying to make a circuit on a Rogers material or some kind of softboard, then it's a real pain because you have to come back and you know wire bond or something. Um, but Lang couplers are good. Lots of people use them. T flip flops are a real interesting idea that I haven't seen implemented, but would theoretically make a jitter limited quad hybrid split. Uh, this is where you have uh, two flip flops, uh, D, two D flip flops, and you um, invert one. So you have you drive it with twice your LO frequency, and then the output of one side is um, is frequency divided, and the output of the other side is frequency divided on the other edge. Uh, and this theoretically gives you, you know, perfect balance, uh, whatever the the digital circuit can give you. But most interesting is that there's no bandwidth limitation to it. Um, there's other disadvantages to it, and and probably most significantly, you you would want to implement this, or these are typically implemented in something like silicon germanium, and um, making mixers in silicon germanium isn't as as use you know they're not as good as uh, other technologies um but it's an interesting idea that that could be done if somebody ever needed a dc to 67 gigahertz um well maybe dc to 30 gigahertz iq mixer and the last one is the marky method which is the 3db quad hybrid so a a, a standard coupler any backward wave coupler will give you a 90 degree uh, phase uh, phase split. Um, the difference between a normal coupler and a 3 dB quad hybrid is that most coupler backward wave couplers are like 10 dB, 20 dB. Uh, if you make it even power split 3 dB, then you have a, a quad hybrid. And these can be made um, with excellent balance and high power handling. And um, they're just very, very nice circuits. All of the hard parts are parts that Marky takes care of you. They're large, they're, they're difficult to design, they're difficult to make planar. Um, you just have to be very careful with the design. And this is um, basically Chris Markey's specialty. He's been working on quad hybrid coupler design since his, his first days at Markey and um, has essentially captured all of the techniques necessary to make these uh, state of the art. So, now we are going to take a break. I'm going to pull, oops, I'm going to pull the uh, the pull back up, and uh, okay. So only only about a third of people have voted. So I'm going to give you one more minute to finish voting, um, and I will I will warn you that uh, I haven't covered all of the questions yet. So there, there may be, they may be kind of difficult questions. And the questions are, um, well, I, I will, okay, I'll give you one more. So which components are always present in an IQ mixer? The in-phase power splitter, the out-of-phase power combiner, uh, the mixer, and the diplexer. Number two, what factors can be improved through calibration, phase noise, image rejection, L to R isolation, and IP3. 
And number three, what part of a single sideband mixer does Marky typically not provide? The LO quad splitter, a balanced mixer, the IF hybrid, or the RF power combiner? And here are the results. So everybody got it essentially right. So the components that are always present in an IQ mixer. Uh, so you always have an in-phase power splitter. Uh, you always have a mixer. Um, the in-phase power splitter is also a power combiner, as I mentioned. Um, a diplexer, you may or may not have a diplexer. So you can have an, an IQ mixer without a diplexer. Uh, Out-of-phase power combiner, I just made a poorly worded question. So out-of-phase power combiner could refer to a Balan, and those are present in balanced IQ mixers typically. Um, but what I meant to say by that was the LO uh, quad splitter. And that's, uh, it's kind of a trick question because uh, it's, uh, it's only a splitter. It's not a, an out-of-phase combiner. It's not a quad combiner. So <laughs> that was, that, I should have done better on that question. Um, number two, what factors can be improved through calibration? The, we'll, we'll cover this in a couple minutes. The image rejection can be improved. The L to R isolation can be improved. The IP3 is fixed by the uh, mixer that you're using, and the phase noise is fixed by the LO drive that you're using. Nothing you can do about it. So the answer is image rejection and L to R isolation. Which part of a single sideband mixer does Marky typically not provide? Uh, the LO quad splitter, the balanced mixer, and the RF power combiner are all devices that we always provide. The IF hybrid is something that you usually would buy on your own. Okay. Thanks everybody for playing. Now I'm going to talk about weird applications uh, or not, not, not typical communications applications for the IQ mixer. These are questions that, th these are applications that we get a lot of questions about on the tech support line. And they come typically from researchers or other, you know, novice, you know, chemistry experts, but not, not necessarily microwave experts. And uh, the reason that that researchers like to use IQ mixers for doing different weird applications is that they provide for phase control, or uh, as I'll show in a minute, vector control, which means you can do um, things with them. You can create tones with them uh, and you can detect tones with them that you can't with a normal uh, double balance mixer. The first example is uh, the most common, which is used as a vector modulator or as a, a phase modulator. So if you are, trying to uh, create a phase modulated signal. One thing, one way that you can do it is you can take a, an LO tone uh, or take a, a single frequency tone and inject it into your LO port of a, a, a normal mixer or a, a quad high or a uh, IQ mixer. And then if you don't do anything, if you 50 ohm load the IF, then what you'll see at the output is just the L to R isolation. If you start to add a small voltage or current to the IF ports, then you will get a degra degradation of that L to R isolation as you bias the diode, as you uh, forward bias the diodes. Um, when you have uh, completely forward biased the diodes, then you end up with a, a basic insertion loss. So um, if you're using a regular double balanced mixer, you only have two phases that you can output from that. You can output uh, in phase and you can output out of phase by adding a positive or a negative voltage, but you can't do anything in between. Um, if you have an IQ mixer, then uh, what you can do is D, you can change the amplitude coming out of, of the I side and out of the Q side. And that gives you um, the ability, so if you just turn off the I side and turn on the Q side, then you get, uh, well, this is, should be opposite. If you turn on the I side, it should be in phase than the, or out of phase. If you just turn on the Q, then you can get quadrature or anti-quadrature. Uh, and if you add the voltages in between, then you can get all of the phases in between. You just have to control the amplitude. You have to control the current input so that, um, the phases add correctly. And if you can control the, um, the amplitude of each one to get the correct phase, you can also 
uh, increase or decrease the total magnitude of the output vector. The catch here is that uh, the, you know, I said before that the amplitude balance and the insertion loss of the LO quad hybrid don't matter because you can drive the mixer in a 5 dB window. Uh, if you use it as a vector modulator, though, then you, you pay that price because now the signal, the tone, L LO tone is your signal and it's going through this quad hybrid. So you get this additional loss uh, from the quad hybrid. So typically the same IQ mixer will have a narrower bandwidth and higher loss as a vector modulator than it has uh, as a converter. Um, some other caveats when doing this, the rest of the data sheet is kind of out the window. Uh, I, we haven't done enough experimentation to know what the IP3 and the spurs and all that other stuff is going to look like when you're using it as a vector modulator. Um, we only typically give an insertion loss and then you know you have to experiment to see how it's going to work in your system. The inverse of this is uh, use uh, as a vector detector and this is something that I don't know if anyone actually does industrially or, or experimentally. It's just something that's possible. Typically when people are using, so, so if you have two tones at the same frequency and you put them into the LO and the RF and you down convert them, the down conversion will be to DC and the output voltage will be according to the, the phase difference between them. And if the phase is in quadrature, then you'll get zero output voltage. And if the phase is something else, then you'll get an output voltage. And that's what this, that's what this plot is showing. This is the uh, output voltage of a mixer um, as a function of the uncorrected input phase. Um, now, if you, um, the, the, the phase offset is because the L and the R balance have different time delays. So there's like a time shift in here. Typically when people do, um, phase detection, they're trying to detect a phase change for a PLL or for a, a phase noise test. And so they bias it in quadrature and then they, they look at the noise that comes off of here. But if you have an arbitrary signal that you're trying to phase, phase detect, or you're trying to detect the phase between two arbitrary signals, um, you can't do that because uh, if you don't know, uh, there, there's this phase ambiguity. Uh, for a given output voltage, there's two phases that it could be. So you only have 180 degrees of phase, you know, non-ambiguity with a double balanced mixer. With an IQ mixer, since you get the I and the Q, uh, you, can you can perform a calculation and get 360 degrees of phase um, information. The other thing that you can do is calibrate for the, a, a change in input magnitude, uh, which that's why I call it a vector detector instead of just a phase detector, because you can calibrate for the, the change in magnitude. Um, if, if you have two signals that are changing, that are not changing in power together, then that doesn't work anymore. Um, so maybe that's why it's not very common. Uh, this next application is very, very common, but very difficult for me to understand. And this is for um, the pulse generation for quantum computing uh, and quantum detection and uh, things like that. So the, there's a bunch of different um, sensing and medical and uh, research applications where people need to make a microwave pulse with a defined phase uh, profile. And so if one example is quantum computing. This is very popular. A very popular way to do it is the way that um, I think it's John Martinez in uh, Santa Barbara does it, where you take a, a Josephson junction, which is a uh, superconducting, uh, it's a piece of superconducting metal that's interrupted by an, some kind of insulator. And if you run a bias current through it, then it creates a, an oscillating state. And um, by setting the bias current, I think you can change the potential well that it sees, and then you make them interact somehow, and then you read out what it looks like. Uh, and I, I I have a, I've taken quantum mechanics um, and I've tried to read these papers. There's many of them and it's just completely over my head. What I do understand though, is the way that you create the microwave pulses. And that's that you use a uh, digital to analog converter uh, and you, so the, the, the digital to analog converter comes out differentially. Uh, you could use a ballon here or you can use a differential amplifier. Then you drive that into the 
I in the Q ports of the LO. Um, and you can use this technique and then you, you, ban, you low pass filter it to eliminate the, the high side stuff. Um, and you can use this technique to create arbitrary um, pulses, ar arbitrary microwave pulses with varying phase and, and chirp and stuff like that. And then you do the same thing on the, uh, the reading side. Typically this application doesn't require very high dynamic range. So we designed an, uh, a mixer specifically for quantum computing, which is the MMIQ 0416 LSM. And the feature of this is that, like I said, uh, you can ignore the quad hybrid amp imbalance if you just drive it harder. But if you're driving it harder, then um, you need more power. And if you have, if you're trying to drive 100 qubits and each one needs um, three different mixers, IQ mixers, then uh, you might be driving a lot of LO power, you know, if each one needs a, a one watt LO driver. So we use different techniques to uh, make a lower power IQ mixer, uh, lower bandwidth so it's less lossy on the less lossy on the quad hybrid side, and um, we use some other techniques to make the the LO di the diode turn on voltage lower. I think eventually this will be uh, all done in uh, in an, an ASIC, a silicon ASIC, but maybe up to a few hundred qubits, people can use that. <laughs> we'll see. Now, uh, I've mentioned that you can calibrate. We get questions about calibration of IQ mixers a lot. Uh, as I said, the, the performance of the IQ mixer in terms of image rejection or sideband suppression, as with balance and quad hybrids and every other device, depends sensitively on the phase and amp balance. And as you tighten up the phase and amp balance, you can get uh, better and better and better signal suppression, but it becomes more and more sensitive to fabrication tolerances and temperature and, and any kind of you know, vibration, stuff like that. But what you can do is you, uh, because of the way the phases are inherited, you can calibrate it. Um, and because the L to R isolation represents some imbalance in the mixer, that can be slightly calibrated as well. And the technique that you follow to do this is first you apply a DC voltage uh, with no um, IF applied perhaps um, to, the, to these two mixers and you vary it very slightly until you get, uh, until you get a null in the L to R isolation. And then you adjust the amplitude and phase on the IF. Um, Typically, sometimes we would produce, we would modify the LO phase in production, um, and you as a customer would or user would uh, modify the phase on the IF side. And the beauty is that the math shows that uh, it doesn't matter if you do the phase tuning on the LO or the IF. If you have some phase offset, so you have five degree phase offset on the LO, you can add minus five degree phase offset on the IF, and it works out. It it doesn't cause you any problems. Um, so you null the L to R feed through, you uh, null the sideband suppression, and then you have to repeat it at every LO frequency. It's in particular the sensitive to LO frequency because that's where the imbalance in the IQ mixer comes from. Um, and then you also have to measure it. If, you, if you're trying to go over across a broad temperature range, then you would need to do it over temperatures as well. And then you create a lookup table. This is only really uh, capable of providing 10 to 20 dB of improvement. Um, there's limits on what the, uh, the DAC or the ADC can do because of the quantiza quantization noise. Um, and then there's limits, you know, there's physical limitations, but depending on how big your actual construction is and, and how much phase variation you expect to see across it, stuff like that. And the last application, um, point I'm going to make is on linearity. Now, when you take, so I'm, I'm talking about the linearity of the IQ mixer versus the linearity of the double balance mixer cores on their own. When you take a double balance mixer core with a certain IP3 and P1DB and you put it into the uh, IQ structure or the single sideband structure, the first thing that happens is you get a improvement in the IP3, the P1DB, all those other uh, single, you know, input signal dependent uh, harmonics uh, or distortion because you're just cutting the power in half. 
you know, because the, there's the in phase power split on the RF or there's the power split on the, um, the IF hybrid, that loss gives you an improvement in linearity. And I, in the table, I, I say it's 3 dB, but you also get 3 dB plus whatever excess insertion loss you have on the power splitters. For multi-tone um, harmonics, multi-tone distortion, something weirder happens. And that's that depending on the spur that you're looking at and the, um, the sideband that you're looking at, um, you can get spur Deg you can get spur cancellation or you can get spur enhancement even, very slight spur enhancement from the single sideband configuration. And I've tried to create, I've tried to, to derive what that's gonna look like um, by calculating the phase of each harmonic. And it becomes very, very difficult to do because as you get to higher order harmonics, the phase, uh, you know, a, a three degree phase offset at the fundamental becomes a 15 degree phase offset at the fifth harmonic. Um, and there are other, you know, there are a bunch of different terms that add together into that fifth harmonic. So the best thing to do at this point is to either simulate or uh, experimentally uh, try different things to see how much spur suppression you're going to get for a fixed plan. Um, so the takeaway from that is that if you have a, a spur problem, you may be able to get improvement by using a single sideband or an image reject uh, architecture. Um, and probably you won't, <laughs> you have to, you'd have to try the, the simulation and, and see what kind of results you get. Um, or you can just email support at markymicrowave.com and we can do the investigation for you, um, you know, experimentally and on our, uh, on our nonlinear device models. That's one thing I didn't mention. For all of our IQ mixers, we have nonlinear device models available on the web that you can download and you can play with all of these things yourself in ADS or in microwave office. Um, you can look at what, typically if you use an ideal IF hybrid, you can get good results and you can reproduce them because uh, you can make ideal, you can buy ideal IF hybrids at low frequencies. So all of our IQ mixers um, are available surface mount, um, bare die, connectorized modules. Um, we sell all of the devices inside and in various uh, combinations. Uh, this is really right in the middle of our wheelhouse. All of the information that I presented here is available in the IQ primer uh, or in the tech notes, the IQ tech notes on our website. So if there's something that um, I went through too fast, you can go back and read through it there. And if you have a other questions, I'm going to stick around after this and answer questions for, you know, however long you have them. And after that, you can email support at markymicrowave.com. As always, our mission is to empower you, our customers, to design faster, simplify production, to eliminate complexity, and most importantly, to shatter your performance barriers. Thank you very much for attending. And uh, now I'm going to stick around and uh, take your questions.